Welcome to the Voice of Salvation programming, whose main source is to be an inspiration to you through the message of hope and peace. And this is only achieved when you remain in tune. Stay with us and you will be blessed. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 101, verse 7, He that worketh deceit shall not dwell within my house. He that telleth lies shall not tarry in my sight. The 101st Psalm is regarded as the portrait of an ideal ruler or king. In this verse, we see his standard for the honesty of those who surround him. Those who practice deceit are denied a place in his household. Their presence would disrupt the harmony and security of all. Trust and confidence would be threatened. Lying is one of the sins which is most often denounced in the Psalms. There are many ways to lie, and regardless of what form a lie takes, it is still a lie. Anything that deceives or creates a false impression is a lie. Withholding the truth may be untruthful in certain situations. We are to be honest in tone looks, silence, and in our statements. This text has profound application to the personal life within my house. Psalms 102 verse 2 and 7. It also speaks to us of our own selves. No man is ready to be a public leader until he is able to control his own house in which he lives. Our private life should be watchful and cautious refusing to allow anything contrary to the holiness of our God. Deceitfulness must not be allowed to take root. We must keep our integrity in all the little decisions we make and in all of our relations with other people. To allow the stains of dishonesty to take hold will weaken the whole fabric of our personalities. Virtue of Honesty The Bible tells us in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, verse 13, the following, Thou shalt not have in thy bag diverse weights, a great and a small. The idea literally is a stone and a stone, one for buying and a smaller or lighter one for selling. 
The mention of the subject in Holy Scripture shows us how God displays a lively interest in every phase of human activity. Nothing is isolated from His concern over us. Now, as we continue to read Deuteronomy 25, verse 14 tells us that thou shalt not have in thy house diverse measures, a great and a small. It is so ordained by God that men should do commerce together. And in so doing, they have opportunity to practice the virtues of justice and equity. If men did not exchange property and labor, the beautiful qualities of honesty could not be appreciated. God insists on being present to judge and hold us accountable in the smallest act of buying and selling. For here is a field ideally suited for either fidelity or for fraud. Now, as we continue to read Deuteronomy 25, verse 15 says the following, But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight, a perfect and just measure shalt thou have, that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. It's interesting to note in verse 15 that it says, But thou shalt have a perfect and just weight. In other words, there's a reward for our honesty. Thou shalt not have this. Thou shalt not have that. God first pulls down so that he may build up. The unsightly must be torn down so the beautiful can be erected. Corruptness must be taken away so purity can be established. Prune off the diseased limbs so that the tree may develop healthy branches that thy days may be lengthened in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Only as Israel continued faithful to God and kept his commandments, could she continue to possess the land God had given them. When they kept on sinning after repeated warnings, they lost their right to possess Canaan and were taken captive and scattered among the nations. Dishonesty in the private life Servers one from the favor and blessings of God. It brings disgrace and shame. It lowers the individual in the eyes of his fellow men and loses for him the confidence and respect so vital to healthy social relations. Some people are forced to move from place to place in order to escape, if but temporarily. Now, the consequences of their dishonest dealings with their neighbors, friends, family, and others. Another man may live for a lifetime in one community and maintain the respect of all who know him. The former is hounded outwardly and inwardly by the results of his deceitfulness. And the later lives in peace and enjoys the abundance of blessings which ensue from a life of integrity. Now, according to the Bible, dishonesty is also an abomination. Verse 16 of Deuteronomy 25 says, For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. So in other words, to be regarded by God as an abomination is as one writer described it, a concentrated curse. How much better to be regarded as the apple of his eye? Actually, honesty is reward enough in itself alone and that it gives such personal peace and provides the ground for genuine happiness. Now, we'd love for us to look at Samuel's integrity, referring to 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 3 through 5. Let's begin at verse 3. The Bible says, Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. And then he asked the question, Whose ox have I taken? Or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind my eyes therewith? And I will restore it you. Now, having read those scriptures, we're open to an investigation here. The Bible says in verse 3, Behold, here I am. Then it says, Witness against me before the Lord. Now, the occasion of Samuel's speech was the recognition of Saul as the first king of Israel. 
The speech opens with attention to the integrity of Samuel's leadership. That's found in verses 1 through 5 of 1 Samuel chapter 12, followed by reproof of Israel for their rebellious and ungrateful living. And finally, the Lord gives evidence of Samuel's uprightness. There are similar scenes in the book of Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, and also in the book of Nehemiah chapter 5. But because of the instructions he is about to give them, Samuel refers to his record as a man of blameless character, a leader worthy to be heard and followed. This is important for any spokesman for God to consider. When a man stands to speak of sacred things, his whole life stands with him in support of it or to undermine what he says. Now, the Bible says that and before his anointed, specifically Samuel speaks of King Saul, but it also means more. It is the first time a king is referred to by the title of the true Messiah, which in Greek would be Christos. The Bible says, of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind my eyes therewith? No man had been able to influence Samuel's decisions with gifts. When he judged the people, each case stood on its own merit, and he gave righteous judgment to rich and poor alike. His eyes were never blinded to the truth by gifts. This has been a constant problem in government, in business, in all other systems of human activity for this manner. Some men will sell their decisions to the highest bidder. Now, as we continue to read 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 4 says the following, And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. Now, we see here that Samuel's testimony stands firm, because the people said that thou hast not defrauded us, or oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. You see, the people agreed that Samuel had been upright. His judgeship of Israel and the management of their internal affairs had been above reproach. Their desire for a king was not because of dissatisfaction with Samuel's leadership in internal manners, but because they wanted to be like other nations. They wanted a leader in war against the nations which surrounded them and oppressed them of all sides. It was a mistake, as Samuel told them, but they stubbornly insisted. Now Saul seemed to be competent in war, but he failed to lead the people successfully in peace. Now verse 5 of 1 Samuel chapter 12 says, And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day. Do ye have not found aught in my hand? And they answered, He is witness. Now as we see here, we see a divine witness in what he says. It is a marvelous thing that a man can search his own heart in private and find that his life is clean of having wronged his fellow men than to have that record confirmed in public by others and by God, both in private and in public, as in the case of Samuel. Some modern scholars have suggested that Samuel was an old meddler who wanted to be king himself, and this was the reason for the way he spoke so strongly to the people. Now, this is a fabricated notion, for there is nothing in the Scriptures to indicate such an attitude on Samuel's part. He was a man of integrity who loved the people of Israel. He knew that they were making a mistake and tried to warn them, but they would not be persuaded against their desire for a king. Now, seeing all of this, as we turn now to the New Testament, we must learn about the honesty to God and to man. The Apostle Paul had a little bit to say concerning this in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 21. If you go with me there, the Bible says, providing for honest things, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. You see, honest things are honorable, good, admirable, and beautiful. This is the quality of things men should be aiming for in their lives. We're reminded of the Apostle's admonition in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, to think on things which are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report. 
lives filled with such wholesomeness will be rich and satisfying. But alas, the nature of men tends to corrupt their lives with the vulgar and contaminating thoughts and practices. Appearances are important, yes, of course, but God knows whether or not we are honest without our giving attention to appearances. But we must practice honesty in the sight of men. A Chinese proverb says, In a field of melons, do not stoop to tie your shoes, for it would appear as if you might be trying to steal a melon. Now the text, abstain from all appearance of evil, conveys the same caution. Attention to appearances will help protect against having your good being evil spoken of. Now, strict honesty in all things is essential to effective Christian witnessing. How can a man minister? How can a man hold the position of leadership or testify of spiritual things if his life is tainted with dishonesty and carnality? Those who live above reproach before God must also remember that popular opinion can be used against them if any room is given to the adversary through carelessness. Ministerial reputations have been ruined by lies which have been given support by unwise conduct. A little support to a lie is all some minds need to finish off an otherwise spotless life of usefulness in the service of the Lord. And I want to leave you with these thoughts. The poet Robert Burns stated, Prince and lords are but the breath of kings, an honest man's the noblest work of God. Honesty covers such a broad spectrum that it is impossible to explore every area of the subject. There are many things which are beyond question, dishonest. Such things as false weights and measures are also wrong. However, there are many other areas of dishonesty, thoughts, as well as deeds can be dishonest. One can be dishonest without saying a word. Sometimes the expression of the face or a nod of the head is sufficient to leave the wrong impression. You may quickly add that it is impossible to know how to act and how to answer in every situation. This is precisely the point of what we're talking about today. Honesty must come from within. God told the people about weights and measures, obvious dishonesty. Christ in his coming explains that one's heart needs to be cleaned up. This is the place to start in order to provide for honest things.